Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Helping All Students Succeed, Nine Things Culturally Relevant Educators Do. My name is Kayla Burrow, and I'm AVID's Marketing Communications Specialist. I'll be your moderator for today. Before we begin, let me just take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar is being recorded, and we'll email that recording, slide deck, and additional resources to all registrants next week. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions or comments, please use the chat or Q&A boxes. There will also be a short question and answer session at the end of today's webinar. We also encourage you to tweet out your thoughts and takeaways from the webinar using the hashtag AllMeansAll. It's now my honor to introduce Patrick Briggs. Before joining AVID, Patrick spent 15 years as a teacher and administrator. He has been an AVID Center employee for 10 years, starting as the AVID Texas State Assistant Director and is currently the AVID Texas State Director. He is also the co-author of AVID Culturally Relevant Teaching, a school-wide approach. Patrick's passions lie in helping all learners achieve at high levels and graduate from high school, college, and career ready. His love is working with teachers, the most valuable resource in a school, to equip them with the tools and skills to help all students obtain success in school and life. You can connect with Patrick on Twitter at pbriggs728 or through email at pbriggs at avid.org. You can also connect with AVID and our culturally relevant teaching team on Twitter with the handles at AVID for College and CRT Nation. Now I'd like to hand things over to Patrick and really get this webinar started. Patrick? Well, thank you, Kayla. I am excited and very delighted to be able to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. I know it is a school day and I see lots of folks on the call and I've seen in the chat that there are lots of folks who are joining us with teams. So we're excited. Let's go ahead and get started. So the outcome of this webinar today is I want you to be able to take the strategies that we share with you and take those and integrate those into your lesson starting tomorrow. I'm going to give you several practical ideas, a lot I'll be validating you as great teachers, but some of them you'll say, huh, you know, that's something that I want to start doing to be more culturally relevant in my classroom. So that's our outcome. This, of course, would not be an AVID session without an essential question. I know all of you have Cornell notes in front of you, so I would love for you to capture this essential question, because like a great AVID teacher, I will be revisiting this essential question at the end of our session. So our essential question here, how can I use CRT strategies immediately in my classroom so that all students are engaged and learning at higher levels of rigor? And as you're capturing that, I love essential questions. Changed my life as an educator because I can remember when I was that first-year teacher, I wrote my objective on the board, and I would say, hey, 12-year-old people, my objective today is for you to be able to distinguish among the characteristics of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And then I'd look at a bunch of 12-year-olds and say, hey, so what are we supposed to do today? And they'd say, I have no idea. You write that up there every day, Mr. Briggs. So what I realized is the objective was really for me, but to keep it real, it was being compliant with an administrative directive. So I wanted to get paid, so I had my objective on the board, but I also would take that objective and turn it into an essential question. You 12-year-old people will be with me for 45 minutes. What should you be able to answer as a result of our time together? So that's ours. So I know you have that on your Cornell notes as your essential question. So let's go ahead and get started. So just starting, this is a culturally relevant teaching webinar, and so we want to look at what it is. You can see on the screen the definition for CRT according to Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, who is credited with coining the term. And one of the things that I love to point out when I'm doing my culturally relevant teaching seminars or workshops is culturally responsive teaching is not the same as multicultural education or social justice education. And this comes from the work of Zaretta Hammond. And that's true. They're very related, but they're different things. So when I do CRT seminars, when I do CRT workshops, I do incorporate multicultural education and social justice education, but they are not the same. 
They're very related, but culturally responsive teaching is really focusing on building the student's learning power. It's not about diversity training, it's about helping students reach deeper levels of understanding. So the strategies we're gonna share are good for all kids. That's why I love the hashtag all means all. These are strategies that you'll be able to use with all of your kids starting tomorrow. I do workshops on multicultural education, uh, but this is about making sure all of our students have access to our curriculum. What can we do as educators to ensure that all of our kids are successful? So that's really what CRT is about, closely related to multicultural education and social justice education. But CRT is really about us as teachers, what we can do instructionally to ensure that all of our kids are successful. So let's get into it. Number one, of course, this webinar is billed as the nine things you can do. It probably will give you a bonus depending on time. But let's jump into it. Number one, in no particular order, using high engagement strategies. And of course, I love WICOR, and you can see on your screen, WICOR stands for Writing, Inquiry, Collaboration, Organization, and Reading. Incorporating those into all of our lessons. One of the things I do is I take my students' age, and every time their age kicks in on the clock, I stop what I'm doing instructionally and allow them to have a WICOR moment. Now, I'm gonna practice what I preach, so in a, in a while, we're, we're gonna do that. But WICOR allows me to stop being the sage on the stage and become the guide on the side. And my kids are engaged at much higher levels of rigor, and they are looking at my curriculum in deeper levels. So just to give you an example, I was doing a workshop recently where I was, say, speaking for 30 minutes, and I could see in the 30 minutes that most people were with me, I'd like to believe, but, you know, some people were ready to tune me out. And so I said, hey, let's stop for a WICOR moment. Let's make sure that you are engaged and working at higher levels of rigor. So when I said, okay, what I want you to do is one of my avid strategies, let's just say stand, share, sit, which I love to call stand and deliver because I said stand, share, sit three times real fast. One time it didn't work out for me. That's another workshop. Let's move on. But so stand and deliver where I would say, hey, let's take one minute to write your thoughts about what we just did. Write your thoughts about what I had just said in our classroom. And then I had them stand up at their tables, share, and of course, as they shared, they all took a seat. Because when I was a first-year teacher, I would lecture to kids for 45 minutes and then send them on to second period and say, good luck with that test Thursday study. <laughs> well, when the test came, I realized that some of my students were successful and some of them weren't. But because I knew it all at 21, I blamed 12-year-old people. I said, I know I'm a good teacher. I've got a teaching certificate that expires at life and a college degree. So it must be you 12-year-old people that are the problem. And what I realized is the person in the classroom who does the most work is the person in the classroom who does the most learning. And for 45 minutes, I was working it out. I knew seventh grade science backwards and forwards because I was doing most of the work. I didn't realize until the test that the 12 year old people weren't as proficient as I was. And again, I knew I taught, so I blame them. So my CRT must do number one is to incorporate those learning breaks. Because when I do that, I get to walk around and be the guide on the side. I get to hear what my students are thinking. And the great thing with that, two things happen automatically. One, they are all engaged because I've set them up to be successful. Started with a quick write. Write for me your thoughts on the last 12 minutes of this class. So they were ready to have the conversation. And as I walked around, I noticed that they were talking about my classroom content at much higher levels of rigor. When I was in front of them, I was giving them lots of knowledge and comprehension. But when they got together in their little groups and started talking, they were applying what I had said in the last 12 minutes. 
I heard many of them analyzing. They were taking what I had said apart and discussing it. I heard a lot of them synthesizing. They were now putting it back together in a way that made sense to them. And I heard 12-year-old people evaluating what I said. And I realized real quickly then, I need to do this as often as I can because they're going to be engaged, all means all, all of them engaged, and they are working at much higher levels of rigor than they would be if I were just standing up there talking to them for 45 minutes. So my CRT must do number one is to work with kids, and for me, whenever their age kicked in, I would stop and say, I want you to do the work. I want to hear what you were thinking. And only then was I able to know if I was successful as a teacher. Instead of looking at 12-year-old people and saying, are you successful? I saw those wicker moments as, was I good in the last 12 minutes? And that helped to drive my instruction for the next 12 minutes. Number two, oh, one of my favorites. What do you celebrate? Because what you celebrate is what you value all day long. Just to give you an example, I'm, I'm in Texas. I would, I did this. I would pull kids out of class once a week. I would say, you know what? Physics is not important today. Chemistry, I know you like it, not today. Algebra, forget it. All of you need to leave your classroom and come down to the gym so that you can worship football players. Now, we called it a pep rally. You know, that, it sounds better than what I just said. But keeping it real, I was actually pulling children out of class to say school is not important, learning is not important, academics is not important. What's important is that 100% of you leave class to come down and hear cheerleaders cheer, bands play for people who do something with a ball. And then I was shocked that all the kids wanted to be football players. I was shocked that all the kids wanted to be on the sports team. What I realized is I was telling children what I valued based on what I celebrated. So we want to make sure, being culturally relevant, that we are providing positive reinforcement for things other than sports, music, and entertainment. People ask me all the time, hey, Patrick, why do all the black boys want to be basketball players, NBA, NFL? And I say, well, you know, first, I don't speak for all black people, but I have an answer for you. Second thing I say is, because you tell them to. And they look back at me and say, oh, I have never told a, a kid to go to the NFL. Or, I say, oh, yeah, you have. Because you pull them out of school once a week and tell them to go worship people who do things with a ball. I have no problem with that. My problem is, how often do you celebrate academics? Because what I did for celebrating academics is I had an honor roll breakfast once a semester, and only honor roll kids could go to it. This, this was me on the intercom. Teachers, please allow the kids with the blue pass to come down to the cafeteria for the honor roll breakfast. Only kids with the blue pass should be out of class. All other students, please stay in the classroom. I realized half the kids with the blue pass didn't even come to the honor roll breakfast. They were embarrassed, ashamed to come, because everybody else who had to stay in class would tease them on the way out saying things like, nerd, nerd, you're going to the nerd celebration, only the other nerds can go. Wait till Friday. You'll have to miss your nerd class to come worship me for the pep rally. I'll be on the floor of the gym. You'll be in the bleachers, but you're going to miss your nerd class. And so what I realized then is I have to celebrate what I value. If I say this is an institution of learning, then I need to celebrate that more than just an honor roll breakfast once a semester when I'm pulling kids out of class once a week to celebrate sports. Again, I have nothing against celebrating sports and entertainment, 
But when we look at a lot of our kids who say, I want to be an actor, I want to be, be on American Idol, I want to be in the NFL, it's because we tell them to. Because what you celebrate is what you value. Number three, oh, love this one, relational capacity. Don't ever underestimate the power of relational capacity. What can I get you to do to, with, and for me solely based on our relationship? Relational capacity. I learned this the hard way. As that first-year teacher, I'm going to keep it real with y'all. There were a couple of kids that didn't like me, and there were a couple of kids I didn't like. And those kids were not successful in my classroom. It had nothing to do with their intelligence or their ability. We just didn't have a good relationship. And so they saw no point in pleasing me or working for me. And I realized that same kid would go to fifth period and work his tail off for Miss Jones. And she loved him. And I said, wait a minute, you've got an A in Miss Jones' class and you have an F in my class. What is happening between our two classes? And at that point, I realized quickly that Ms. Jones wasn't special. She chose to invest in relational capacity. Uh, all of us on this call, you're, we're great educators, great teachers. We have all taught a kid that would do anything in the world for us. I mean, that kid would do his work in our room, and he had a solid A, B, just great kid. And that same kid, would leave your classroom, go to third period, and act like a fool. Let's keep it real. Does that kid change his personality in the five minutes between our classes? No. What changes is the relational capacity between that kid and the significant adult in the other room. I remember I'd go to in-school suspension and visit my kids uh, who had been sent for various reasons, and I'd say, what are you doing in here? Oh, my gosh, you're one of my best kids. What? How could you have possibly ended up in, in, in school suspension? And the kid would look at me and say, well, Mr. Briggs, she don't like me. She racist. I can't stand her, huh? And I was like, whoa, I, I don't know who this kid is. I, I've never seen this kid. But what I realized that quickly is I wasn't special when I became a much better teacher over 25 years ago. I had chosen to invest in relational capacity. Because especially when I went into in-school suspension and I saw my kids sitting there, I realized quickly the punishment doesn't change behavior. That's not its purpose. Think about it. Those of us on this call, you ever had a kid go to in-school suspension and come back fixed? Really? You ever had a kid go to in-school suspension and come back and say, "Woo! I saw the light in there. I am going to straighten up and fly right. I'm going to be good and make straight A's for the rest of my life. Please. It's a punishment. Its job is not to change behavior. Think about it. Half the people in prison will be back three years after getting out. It's a punishment. Punishment doesn't change behavior. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, well, I used to get punished. It changed my behavior. No, no, not really. What it did is it modified your behavior when the punisher was present. Just for example, I, I speed to get to work every day. I'm on the freeway just speed. I understand there's a punishment associated with that. It doesn't change my behavior. I think all of us speed on the freeway. Maybe it's just me. But I'm speeding on the freeway. What do you think I do when I see the cop car on the side of the road? <laughs> I slow down. And then when I've gotten far enough and I say, ooh, he didn't get me, and I can't see him in my rearview mirror anymore, <laughs> I speed back up. So notice that the threat of punishment or punishment, because I've gotten tickets before, didn't change my behavior. <laughs> it will modify my behavior when the punisher's present. And as a teacher, I realize, well, I, I, I don't want to be the punisher. What I want to do is build relational capacity so that kids will make choices to do things for me that maybe they wouldn't ordinarily or naturally do. And when they're in the class with me, they can learn. If they're in in-school suspension, it's not going to happen. This is not a webinar on punishment. I know I just went off on a tangent, so let's move on. Let's just suffice it to say relational capacity will is worth its weight in gold. Number four, ah, 
Love it. I'm not trying to change what you're doing. I'm not trying to change what you are teaching. But what I want to do is change the delivery, providing the scaffolding, the tools to get there. When we look at a building that may be under construction or being renovated, we see scaffolding out front. Eventually, we want that scaffolding to come down, and we have a beautiful, successful building. But providing the tools, it's one of the things I realized as an educator, is I wasn't scaffolding for kids. I was teaching little bitty Patricks. If you were a little bitty Patrick, you did really well in my classroom because I defaulted to my learning style. I made it. This is how I learned, this is how teachers taught me, so this is how you teach. I was successful. Well, I realized quickly, that's just not going to work for all kids. It all means all. So changing the delivery, scaffolding, great example of that <laughs> was I used to give kids a five-page paper on the digestive system. We're going to write a five-page paper on the digestive system. Day one, ten, ten days we're going to do this, two weeks of school. Day one, let's go to the library. I'm going to give you time in this library, do what you do. Day two, let's go to the computer lab. You have 45 minutes, make it happen. Day three, I'm going to give you time in class. Day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day ten. Day ten. <laughs> All right, class, we spent ten days in the library, computer lab, time in class. I need you to pass up those five-page papers. I think I got two. But, of course, <laughs> I'm in the teacher's lounge saying, I know I taught. I know I gave them time. But what I didn't do is I didn't scaffold and give them the tools to be successful. That next year when I realized that I needed to scaffold, I did the same exact thing. I couldn't change my curriculum. But what I did was that year I said, okay, day one, let's go to the library. <laughs> Looked at a room full of children and said, you're not getting out of here. You're just not leaving until I see one sentence. That's it. One. One. What is the opening sentence of this paper going to be? One. How are you going to open it? How are you going to catch my attention? What's a great thesis statement? What are you going to say to start this paper? I need to see it before you leave here, and I want two of your peers to see it before you leave here. Guess what happened at the end of day one? All of them left with a beautiful opening sentence. That was much more than I got from half of them the year before. Day two, let's go to the computer lab. You're not getting out of here without me seeing a beautiful opening paragraph. We started with a beautiful sentence yesterday. All of you have one. How are you going to develop that to ensure that you are opening this paper with a great opening paragraph? I need to see it. Two of your peers need to see it and sign off on it. Guess what happened at the end of day two? All of them left with a beautiful opening paragraph. Day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day ten. Guess what I got that year? All of my papers from all of my kids all of the time. I didn't change my curriculum. I changed how I delivered it and I scaffolded to give my kids the tools to get there. Number five, oh, love this. Creating lesson plans that include all learning styles but also keeping left and right brain in mind. You know, as, as in my teacher's college, I got a lot of tactile kinesthetic, auditory visual, but no one ever told me about left and right brain. School is a left brain institution, set up on left brain norms, left brain rules. It's very logical. This is the way we do it. It's sequential. This is how you enter. This is how you come in. This is what you do. Very rational. Me, me personally, I was, I'm a right brain baby. I, I am very curious and random and holistic. And that's what I realized about that five-page paper. My right brain kids saw the whole paper. So when I said a, a five-page paper, they said, we have to write a paper, and it's just not going to happen because <laughs> that's all I can see in front of me. The kids who were successful, left brain, they saw the parts. Those kids already said, okay, I'm going to start day one and Maybe write a paragraph or two, day two, this is where I'm going to, I'm going to backwards map, I'm going to put on my, because I'm, you know, very logical, sequential. Day eight, my right brain kids had nothing, and I'm looking at them, you haven't done anything. I've given you eight days in the computer lab, and you haven't done anything. And what I realized is, as the teacher, I needed to consider that and use scaffolding to get my right brain babies to see the part. They were just as capable, just as brilliant writers, 
But when I said five-page paper, that's all they could see. All right, your age has kicked in. We'll say the average age of people on this call is 26. So we're going to take one minute. I want to take a quick more break. I want to be able, I want to let you all, I know some of you are watching this webinar in groups. So if you're, if you're alone, what I'd love for you to do is look at your notes. Take your notes so far in the first 26 minutes as a chunk. And what could you write on the left side of your Cornell notes as a question that would be answered by the notes you have so far. If you're in a group, feel free to pair share. I love Cornell Notes because it allowed me to have students use their notes as learning tools. So feel free to just compare notes. Say, hey, what did you write? Hey, I didn't write that. Let me add that to my notes. Why did you write that? I don't remember him saying that. But I'm going to take a full minute to give you a wick or break to look at your notes, refine your notes, revise your notes, add a question on the left, uh, do some inquiry pieces, and if you're with other people, to just do a quick collaboration. But it's going to be a quick minute starting now. I'm going to bring us back in 30 seconds. And if you will finish your thought or your sentence, we'll go ahead and pick it back up. And of course, at the end of this webinar, if you're with a group and you want to do another WICOR activity, please do engage in that. But think about that minute I gave you, that minute. You know, as teachers, we control the variable called instruction. I could have chosen to continue to lecture to you for 45 minutes total. As a teacher here, I chose to stop my instruction to say, I want you to think about what I just said. Those of you who are alone, you probably looked at your notes and started analyzing them. Again, you're working at higher levels of rigor than just my knowledge and comprehension here. And you're engaged using my classroom material. Let's go ahead and pick it back up. Number six. Ah, yes, lovely. Include movement, interaction with, you know, Peers is our baby's number one influence. Number one. Television and the media come a close second. And I realized as a teacher, I wasn't even in the top five. <laughs> so I included movement and interaction with peers. If peers is their number one influence, I wanted to give them opportunities to collaborate and engage with their peers but of course structured through WIC or strategies to ensure that they have the opportunity to be engaged in the learning material and to work at higher levels of rigor. You know, I have a great colleague, Amy Chapman, just a great, great educator, and one of the stories she told me here was um, she knows a young man who was in the, uh, in the military, and this young man was in the military uh, would have been a great kid to go on to college or schooling, but schooling just wasn't a place for him. So he went to the military, and he was sitting in a class in the military, and the sergeant who was teaching the class said, uh, the young man started to fall asleep, and the sergeant who was teaching the class said, uh, young man, you're going to sleep in this class. You're going to go stand in the back. And that young man went and stood in the back, and he said, for the first time, I actually learned something in class. I am a smart kid. I could have gone on to college. But I am realizing for the first time 
that a teacher allowed me to get up and move. A teacher allowed me to just stand. All of us as educators, we've been in workshops and we've seen somebody get up and stand on the side or go stand in the back, you know, just kind of stretch. If, if a 12-year-old did that, we would say, ah, go sit down. Yeah, go to the office. Where are you up? We as adults, we do that all the time because we realize we need to do it to be successful. We can still learn. That's why I love our CRT classes that we teach through AVID. One of the centers we always have is a movement center where in the class you have permission to get up and go over to that center, stretch if you need to, do some waist bends if you need to. And I notice every time I do that, the person who needs to go to the movement center of the room is always engaged, but we're addressing that learner's need. So including and building in movement and interaction with peers, and of course, WICOR and AVID changed my life as a teacher because when I started doing WICOR, those were automatically built in, giving kids the opportunity to talk about it, to dialogue, to debrief, and to move, to get up and say, I need to do this so that I can be a learner in this room. Number seven. Oh. Background knowledge, yes, 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 yes. Activating prior background knowledge. One of the things that I realized as an educator is everybody doesn't come to me with the same background knowledge, but I started teaching like they did. I, I can remember uh, teaching Anne Frank, teaching the, the Anne Frank to students. And of course, in my classroom, I had Johnny, who was Jewish who had a grandparent in the Holocaust, who had talked to him about it. He came to Anne Frank with a lot of background knowledge, was very successful during that unit. I had Mary, whose parents took her to Amsterdam over the summer. She visited Anne Frank's house, saw Shelley Winters Oscar. The rest of the children in the room, this is what I got. Mr. Briggs, why we gotta read this? There's no pictures in this book. You always make us read these boring things. Why we got to read a book about who is Anne? I don't know her. Why are we reading this? And of course, <laughs> at the end of the unit, Johnny and Mary were highly successful. They were no smarter than the other kids. They had some background knowledge that they came with, and so they were successful. So what I realized is I have to use strategies to build my students' background knowledge. So what I started doing was saying, okay, I need kids to come to Anne Frank on the same playing field, because right now they're not. So I said, okay, what is Anne Frank about? Aha, it's about discrimination. It's about being bullied. It's about being treated badly because you're different. I said, I got them. I got them. They're all going to love Anne Frank this year. So what I did was I started out with Avid Weekly articles or articles about just bullying, discrimination, pulling articles. and allowing them to have Socratic seminars about being bullied or discriminated against or treated different because you look different. All of the kids could relate to that. And they were doing deep reading strategies and critical reading strategies, marking the text on these articles about bullying. And then they were having these deep discussions in Socratic seminars about bullying and discrimination. And then and only then did I look at a room full of children and I said, oh, class, Y'all have been awesome. Hey, I've got a book about a little girl in Holland in the 40s. That's not important. But it's a book about a girl she was discriminated against because she was different. She was bullied because she was different. Do y'all want to read that book? A room full of children looked at me and said, <gasps> Mr. Briggs, you have a book about a little girl in Holland in the 40s, but you said that's not important. You have a book about a little girl who was discriminated against and, and treated badly because she was different. If, if such a book exists, Mr. Briggs, please give it to us. We must read it. See, don't tell me what I can't make children excited about doing when I choose to manipulate my variable called instruction to ensure that they all come to me with prior background knowledge. As I realized the kids who did really well were no smarter. They had no more intelligence. They had some prior background knowledge that gave them 
an edge with that particular unit. I love looking at all of my units and saying, how can I make sure they're all coming to me with the same background knowledge? Number eight, oh, yes, identifying and developing our kids' talents. Every kid I had the privilege and honor to teach, and it was indeed a privilege and an honor, every kid was gifted and talented. Maybe not in a way school appreciated, but they could all do something that I couldn't do and do it well. And I realized, wait a minute, these, these kids are gifted, maybe not in a way that the school is going to appreciate, but they can all do something well. And so that's when I said, oh, my gosh, I have, I have been having these kids write a five-page paper on the digestive system. But my goal was for them to show me they knew and understood the digestive system. If that's my goal, why can't I look at a room full of children, which I did, and say, okay, class, 10 days. And I need you to show me you know and understand the digestive system. My next statement was, how you do it is up to you. <laughs> and then for the next two weeks, I had kids excited. Kids came to me, okay, Mr. Briggs, we're cheerleaders. Can we write an original cheer about the digestive system and perform it for the class? Well, I said, of course you can. Two kids came to me, Mr. Briggs, can, can we write an original rap about the digestive system and perform it for them? Well, of course you can. Other kids came to me, hey, Mr. Briggs, we're in Art One. Can we do like a little sculpture? We're doing sculpture right now in Art One. Can we do a sculpture about the digestive system and explain it to the class? Well, of course you can. Of course, a couple of kids said, hey, can we write a five-page paper? I said, well, yes, I guess that's an option too. Sure, why not? So what I then became that guide on the side, making sure all of the kids were successful in showing my objective through their identity and their talents. And when they performed for the class, I said, oh my gosh, the cheerleaders, the rappers, the music kids, the sculptors, I said, oh my gosh, you all just showed me you knew and understood the digestive system, but you also just showed me that you could apply the concepts of the digestive system. You, you all just showed me how you, 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 you all just worked at much higher level rigors than I expected. Shame on me. Because at that point I realized what I had been doing as a teacher was I had been putting ceilings on children. Write the five page paper on the digestive system, do it this way, this way, this way. Don't jump out of this box. That is your ceiling. Don't go any higher than that. That is it. And what I realized by identifying and developing their talents, I was putting the floor underneath children's feet and saying, Here, here's the bare minimum. And you jump as high as you want to. And boy, children at that point showed me that I had been underestimating them as learners. Number nine, seating arrangement. Yes. You know, there is a time for straight rows and straight desks. I call those cemetery rows because kids look dead sitting in them. But think about how you can arrange your, your classroom to be conducive to collaborative strategies, be conducive to WIC or strategies. How are you going to arrange your room and use those different WIC or strategies, allowing kids to be collaborators, inquirers, using each other. So this one kind of rolls all of them into one. How are you going to use those WICOR strategies? How are you going to make sure they're able and have access to engage? And how are you going to make sure they're learning at high levels? And I realized the straight road, the cemetery rows, it just, it just wasn't going to happen. So think about the seating arrangement of your room and how you can arrange it in different ways in order to be conducive to kids using WICOR, being able to collaborate and inquire. Really what I'm saying when I say WICOR is ways for them to be engaged 100% of the time and to be working at higher levels of rigor. And here's the bonus. Do you establish verbal and nonverbal? Oh, yes, call and response. Love this, yes. Because that teacher that I was that first year, and, of course, none of you all do it. I, I'm the only one. But I used to look like I was crazy. I would be in front of my classroom, and when I wanted their attention, okay, sit down, stop, 
Hey, don't. Y'all need to quiet down. Stop flicking lights on. And play. Who looks crazy? And who looks crazy then? <laughs> but when I establish cues, verbal and nonverbal, and call and response, man, just creating that family atmosphere. Just right now on the phone. When I say avid, you say rocks. Avid. Avid. Y'all sounded great. I couldn't hear anybody, but <laughs> I assume you did it. And then I could get the attention of my class in a fun way. I could get the attention of my class in a way that kept the dignity <laughs> of me and all of them, and then establishing lots of verbal and nonverbal cues, you know, something as simple as when I stand over here or, or the kids got used to, okay, if he's going to give us some directions or if he needs to interrupt our collaboration to give us direction, he's going to be in this area of the room. So establishing those. All of the ones that I just talked about, we're talking about culturally relevant teaching. And remember, when we talk about culturally relevant teaching, this seminar or this WebEx is not focused on multicultural education. It's not focused on social justice education, although those are interrelated and, and you know, we do trainings on those as well. But when we're talking about culturally relevant teaching, we're talking about building student learning power. We're talking about helping students reach deeper levels of understanding. And nothing you heard me say was, okay, you need to take the purple girls, because they are so different, and put them over in the corner and teach them this way. And you need to take the Paisley boys and put them over here because they learn this way. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about culturally relevant teaching using strategies to get kids to a deeper understanding. And everything I talked about is good for all kids. Everything I talked about, my left brain, my right brain, my kids from different backgrounds, different socioeconomic status, all of these strategies are great strategies to get kids to engage and work at deeper levels of rigor so that they're academically successful. There is a place for multicultural education. There's a place for social justice education. But today we're talking about how can we make sure that kids are academically successful by manipulating our variable called instruction. You know, we're given curriculum as educators. We're given assessments as educators. In between curriculum and assessment, we control that variable called instruction. And what we choose to do with our variable called instruction controls the trajectory of the rest of a kid's life. And I didn't know that at 21. All right, so let's go ahead and and revisit our essential question. Love for you to take one minute, and we'll take one minute to allow you to answer that essential question, looking over your notes. And of course, those of you taking Cornell notes, this is the time to write your summary. Your summary would be answering this essential question. So let's take one full minute to allow you to review your notes and get a sentence or two that will answer this essential question as your summary. And I'll start the one minute now. I'm going to bring you back in about 30 seconds. All right, go ahead and finish up that thought or that sentence. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Kayla, who will take us into the Q&A. Thanks, Patrick. While we get ready for the Q&A, I want to take a moment to thank you all again for joining us today. We know your time's valuable, and we're thankful that you're spending it with us. 
Uh, just a reminder, we are sending the recording to you all next week, along with information on AVID's culturally relevant teaching and additional resources that can complement this webinar. Also, since our time's limited, we want you to know that we will review all the questions submitted today in the Q&A and uh, create a short FAQ document to share with you in the future as needed. One more thing, we've been seeing you on Twitter. Thank you so much for those tweets. Keep it up. Um, we would love to see you get social with us using hashtag all means all and share your reflections from today's webinar. All right, Patrick, we've got a lot of great questions. One that we saw come up several times was, how can I encourage and coach others to be more culturally relevant? And along those same lines, we saw questions about gaining buy-in and providing professional development around being culturally re relevant. What are your suggestions? Great question. So, one of the things I always tell folks is to start with your own data. It is hard for people to argue with their own data. Now, I've seen people do it, but it's a hard thing to do. Uh, I work with schools all of the time, and one of the first things I love to do is I like to pull their, their data. And when I see data that show 50% uh, of the black students are proficient on third grade reading, 60% of the Latino students are proficient on third grade reading, and 90% of the white students are proficient on third grade reading. First thing I say is, are you aware of this? And then start to have conversations about maybe why that's happening or really want to be solution-oriented. What can we do here? So the first thing I love to do is start with your own data. What do your data show you is happening based on children spending 180 days with you? And then what I want educators to start to understand or to get buy-in is to then say, when we can have those courageous conversations about our own data, then solution-oriented, now what will we do about it? And I love providing the professional development in order for us to be able to do something about it. And a lot of times it is being culturally relevant. It's about what we're doing with that variable called instruction. What can I change? Because remember, I used to look at a room full of 12-year-old people and say, what's wrong with y'all? <laughs> I'm a good teacher. Y'all are the problem. Once I looked at my own data, I started to look in the mirror and say, Patrick, what can you do so that kids are successful? Right now, the 12-year-old people are not being successful, and they have no intention of changing. And I realized it really wasn't up to them to change. What could I do? Because I could do the same thing and get the same results. You know, that's Einstein's definition of insanity, continuing to do the same thing and expecting different results. So I'll just keep teaching the way I'm teaching. If you're cool with your achievement gap, then do that because you can help it perpetuate. But being culturally relevant is saying, what can I do instructionally? And those nine plus one must do's is a great way to start, looking at how can I build in time for my kids to be able to be engaged and to work at higher levels of rigor. Because I don't believe that I should be labeled GT or in an AP class to experience rigor. That's the reason why half the kids who go to our colleges sit in remedial classes, developmental classes that they have to pay for, <laughs> and they don't count as a credit. And I realize what I can do is make sure all of my kids experience rigor because not you all, but me, what I realized in my school was my GT classes, my AP classes, they were not full of the best and brightest. They were not full of the smartest kids. They were not full of the most intelligent kids. My AP class <laughs> was full of the most compliant kids on the campus. Oh, you can sit still and do a packet without talking to your neighbor? We need to have you tested for GT. Oh, <laughs> you do your work and you don't cause any problems? Let me talk to the counselor about moving you to, a, to an AP class. See. I was perpetuating an achievement gap because I was blaming children for not being successful without looking at myself and saying, what could I do? And it's about making sure that I use instructional strategies to engage all kids and raise the level of rigor. 
Now, again, you have to analyze your own data. You may find out, yes, we need multicultural education. Yes, we need social justice education. But I'm concerned about your kids' academic success. So I always want to make sure we're doing culturally relevant teaching. And one of the best ways is, you know, AVID has two great courses, culturally relevant teaching, transforming educators, where we're looking at ourselves, and tr culturally relevant teaching, empowering students, where we're looking at the, through the lens of students, and a great book that goes along with, with both of those. That training alone changed how I taught adults, because now I'm, I'm in the, I have the great privilege and honor to do adult training. And just writing that book and, and writing those strands along with a great team of folks at Avid Center made me a better presenter. A lot of times people say, oh, Patrick, you're so good. I'm like, eh, I'm okay. But really, it's because I have had so much training in culturally relevant teaching. I, I'm not good. I've just had some great professional development in order to teach, to engage, and ensure that all are successful at higher levels of rigor. I hope I answered that question. I know I tend to, especially when I get excited and passionate about a topic, I may go off on a tangent. Any other questions, Kayla? Yes, Patrick. And, you know, that excitement is what makes you so good. Um, here's another question that we received uh, a couple times. I've never faced the barriers that my students face. How can I better understand what my students go through and help them overcome these hardships? That's a great question. I love it. And what I tell people all the time is, I've never been a white girl with two parents at home who had college degrees, but I taught them. <laughs> so it's not that I have to have that experience. You know, looking at me growing up, I was, I, I am a black young man who was raised by a single parent, and we were poor. Notice I didn't say poor. We couldn't afford the other O and the R. We were poor. I didn't need a teacher who came from that background to teach me. And what I definitely didn't need was somebody to feel sorry for me. I needed to be educated so that I could break that cycle of poverty. I didn't need anybody who said, well, you know, I need to understand the poor black kid raised by a single parent. I needed somebody who said, hey, he's coming with a different background, and I need to use some strategies to ensure that he's successful. Because I could do honors work. And the great thing about me, the reason I'm here today and not statistically dead or in prison, the reason I'm here today is because great educators gave me the opportunity to be in the honors classes because they saw something in me. And the only difference is in those classes, the teachers allowed us to pair up, collaborate, do group projects, and that engaged me. When I was sitting in the regular classes, straight row, straight desk, I wouldn't have made it that way. I, I just wouldn't have made it that way. And now I look back and I realize the only reason I made it is because some educator saw something in me and actually gave me the opportunity to go to classes where the teacher said, oh, these are the good kids. These are the smart kids. These are the kids who, who will behave. So I feel good about letting go and letting them walk around and talk because they're the good kids. But the next class that came in, man, if a kid moved, they were in trouble because they were the regular kids or the, the kids that are not like the class that just left. So what I don't want you to do is feel like you have to, you have, to have that background. Remember, 82% of this country's teachers are white women. You, this this well-educated, handsome, highly degreed black man talking to you right now <laughs> is the product of white women teachers. Thank you, white women, for not feeling sorry for me. Thank you, white women, for not saying, hey, you know, he's different, and no, I don't understand. They said, you know what? <laughs> Patrick is 12. He has a lot of baggage, but I expect him to go to college, and I expect him to go on a scholarship, and I'm going to teach him in that manner. And again, I got lucky because somebody moved me to the honors classes. That would never have happened back then in the 70s, I'm dating myself, wouldn't have happened in the 70s had I not been given the opportunity to move to classes where the teacher was using culturally relevant teaching. Now, I believe in the 70s, the teacher didn't even know 
She was using culturally relevant teaching strategies. She was doing good teaching. <laughs> and see, there we go. Culturally relevant teaching. It's good teaching. It's good instructional strategies. That's what my teachers did for me. But again, my friends who were left in the regular classes, they got straight rows, straight desks, packets, don't you move, don't talk, don't breathe. So what I want to say to this person is they're probably asking about multicultural education, and if that's where you are, that's something we could talk about and, 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 and look at. Uh, but remember, I don't want you to feel like you, you need to be a, a poor black boy from a you know, single parent home to teach me. I need you to use good instructional strategies to engage me, raise a level of rigor, and treat me like you expect me to be educated and to go on and do great things. Hope I answered that one. Let's take another one, Kayla. All right. Um, here's one. What is one culturally relevant strategy that all teachers should be implementing? <laughs> Well, I just talked about 10, so no, I'm not going to give you one. Uh, you know, I would say all of them. And one of the things the folks on the on the call don't know is, um, you know, we've been working on this one for a couple of months, and I can remember one of the initial PowerPoints that I sent to you all was probably had like 30 must-dos. <laughs> so to even get it to nine was a struggle, but somebody had always asked me for one. Uh, but I, I, what I believe this person is asking, uh, I'm sorry, I may have misinterpreted. If, if I were to give you one, if I say, hey, start with this one, I'm always going to go to relational capacity because that will get you everything else, building strong relationships with kids. Because all it has to do is a kid just has to say, going back to the previous question, you don't have to look like me to teach me, but I do need to be able to say my teacher respects respects me for who I am, where I come from, and where I'm going. So if you're asking for one, and, and hopefully you'll follow me on Twitter because I will, I will tweet some of the 20 I had to cut to fit into the time, uh, but if, 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 if I had to give you one, I would say relational capacity. And there's some great articles and great books, and I've been tweeting a lot of stuff, and, and at CRT Nation tweets a lot of great stuff on building relationships with kids because that will get you kids who want to do what you're asking them to do all of the time. Do we have time for another one? I think so. Um, here's a good one and it goes along with what you were just saying. What do students from diverse backgrounds appreciate most in their teachers and their schools? All right. Well, I can really go back to the answer I just gave. Um, what I appreciate most is a teacher who unequivocally just my answer would be a caring teacher who accepts no excuses and refuses to let me fail. And that's a, actually a great quote from an article I quote a lot called Closing the Achievement Gap, a Vision for Changing Beliefs and Practices. And that, that's actually a famous quote from that study. When we ask kids who are the consumers of our teaching, what is the most powerful influence on their academic achievement, it is consistent that the answer from children is a caring teacher who accepts no excuses and refuses to let me fail. And when I, as a teacher, made sure my kids understood and believed that I felt that way, there was no limit to what I could do to make sure kids are successful. So that, that, is, that is the one thing I would say any kid, I don't care if you're purple, paisley, green, a caring teacher who accepts no excuses and refuses to let me fail. Do we have time for another? Kayla, do we have time for another? Hey, sorry about that, Patrick. We got one more. In a district where demographics okay. are changing drastically, how can I stay proactive and make sure we are meeting the needs of all students in a culturally relevant way? Okay, great. another great question. 
So that's, that's almost going to have me roll everything I just said into one. So that's happening in a lot of districts. You know, in Texas, we have had a majority minority population for years. But many states are just now starting to experience uh, majority minority. So the demographics are changing. So how can you stay proactive and meet the needs of all of your kids in a culturally relevant way? Again, remember, multicultural education is one thing. Social justice education is one thing. To be culturally relevant, you want to make sure that you are looking in the mirror, manipulating your variable called instruction to engage all kids and to raise the level of rigor. Because as that teacher, I know now, this is a gift I've been given, you know, years later. Because of Facebook, I am friends with a lot of kids who I used to teach 25 years ago. And I get to see them now as, you know, 30, 40 year old people. And they have pictures on their Facebook of their children. I'm looking at little Johnny I taught in, you know, in, in 1990. <laughs> and on his lap is his three month old. I'm looking at little Mary I had the privilege to teach, you know, in, in 1995. And she's got three kids smiling at, uh, at the picture. And this is the one thing I want all teachers to remember. Earlier I said, we actually control the trajectory of the rest of a kid's life by our choices for 180 days of instruction. Looking at those Facebook pictures of the children of the children I had the privilege to teach, I now know. What I did 25 years ago actually controlled the trajectory of the lives of children who had not yet been born. Those children staring back at me on Facebook, sitting on the laps of children I taught, are the beneficiaries of me making choices as a teacher to engage all kids and to raise the level of rigor. So the, the little kid who was like me, single parent, uh, poor, homeless, sitting in his living room with a three month old on his lap saying, hey, I just took off two weeks from my high paying job to be at home with my new baby. And I said, oh my gosh, Patrick, what you did 25 years ago is a affecting the life of that three-month-old. We as teachers control the trajectory of the lives of children who have not yet been born. Please don't ever take that for granted. Please ensure that you know that. Oh, I'm, I'm going to stop y'all from getting me to crying. So let's go ahead and, and end. I know we're a little bit over. Yeah, just a little. Thank you uh, so much, Patrick, for everything. And on behalf of Patrick and all of us here at AVID, I want to thank you all for joining us today one more time. Uh, please connect with us on social media and don't hesitate to shoot Patrick an email. You can learn more about AVID on our website, www.avid.org. Thanks again, y'all, and have a great day.